defeated. <clears throat> if you need to use one of the restrooms down the hall to my left, we're having Bible school every morning, and that's the Red Sea, and the blue uh, shower curtains that you see hanging there, that's the waves of the Red Sea that were rolled back. And <clears throat> there's a men's restroom uh, down this hall to the right, it's the first door. You have to look for it behind the shower curtain. But there's another one on the other end, and it doesn't have a shower curtain over it. Uh, and the ladies' rooms are on this side, down the right hall. But again, we're thankful for the presence of each one in the services tonight. And for the benefit of those who are visiting, possibly for the first time, or have never met Brother Brent King, uh, Brother Brent uh, is from Franklin, Louisiana, and uh, we're thankful that uh, the Lord is blessed that he could come and bring God's word to us this week. We've had some good services, good spiritual services, some good messages. We've had some good sessions in our Bible school each morning, but continue to pray uh, for all of these services. Brother Brent. Thank you, Brother Jimmy. I'm thankful tonight to be here. I'm joined, Brother Long, in welcoming all of you to the service. I, too, appreciate you coming and being here. I want you all to look at your watch right quick before we get started, though, because um, it ain't 730. And that's fine with me. I mean, if you're saying the 815, that's fine with me, but just don't charge me with that extra time when we, when we get done. I am glad to be here. I'm thankful to see all of you that are here. And I need your prayers as I try to stand tonight and bring the things that are on my heart. If you have your Bibles, turn please to the book of 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5 is where we're going to be reading from. i tell you what let's do. Let's just go ahead and read the passage of Scripture. Then we're going to come back and we'll talk some about it. I'm going to, be re I'm going to begin to read in verse 5 of this passage of Scripture. We won't read the entire chapter. In fact, I plan to read down through uh, verse 13. 1 John chapter 5, we begin to read in verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which He hath testified of His Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of His Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. I believe there are four types of people as it relates to salvation. And what I mean, what I mean by that is this. There are some people who know without question that they are lost, they've never been saved. Would you agree with me that that category is this, that you see folks from time to time and they make no pretension about it. They don't say anything other than the fact that I have never been saved, I've never been redeemed. So that's one category, a group of people that know that they are lost. Another group is uh, a group of people who are lost, but they don't know it. They believed some false doctrine or they have uh, maybe, um, uh, you know, tried to offer works or, or something. Some way in their mind, they have justified the fact that God will accept them one day 
regardless of what they've done with Jesus Christ. Folks, religions are built on that. And they're full of people who I'm convinced are lost people, but they don't know it. And you may say, well, Brother King, you're, you're kind of judging religion. No, no, I'm not. Now, I'll tell you this. I believe when it comes to salvation, there is but one way. I don't believe there's a good way, a better way, and a best way. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. And any religion that teaches or any person that believes any other thing outside of Jesus and His atoning work on the cross of Calvary, then regardless of how religious they are, how long they may have been a member of a particular church, you know, I, I've known people who kind of got caught up in the emotion of things at church. We're emotional people. Uh, sometimes, you know, the tears of others move our emotion. Sometimes the songs that are sung, they move our emotion. Sometimes the preacher moves our emotions. And it has been known that people would get caught up in the emotion of things and, and maybe make a profession of faith, but never really have a, a new birth in Christ. So there's two categories. And then I believe there are people who know without question that they are saved. I believe there are some folks, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand tonight. I no way to, I, I want to put you on the spot in any way. But I, I think if I did, if I asked the question, how many of you know that without question that you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, I believe hands would go out, or would go up rather, over all of this building. Now, not every hand would go up because there probably are some here who know you're in the category of those that are lost. And so not every hand would go up. Well, we've talked about three, three of them so far. Those that are lost and know it. Those who are lost and don't know it. Then there are those who are saved and know it. But there's another group as well. I believe there's a group of people who are saved and don't know it. Now that may sound odd to you, and you may have never heard a preacher say it just that way. But before you discount that and throw it away, let me ask you, have you ever known anyone who uh, you know, uh, came to uh, and made a profession of faith and and then later, Brother Jimmy may have come back to you and said, look, I'm kind of confused. I, I really don't know where I stand with the Lord. Do you, do you automatically assume that that person's lost? Are, are, are there some things you need to go over with them in Scripture? Are, aren't there some things that you need to... Hadn't it been that after maybe someone would come and say, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where I stand that after consulting the Bible, after counseling them and, and talking to them, maybe they come back and say, you know, preacher, I was saved all the time. And I just didn't know it. Doubts had come in. Other things, the, the circumstances of life. Satan, the prince of the power of the air. This hostile environment that we live in. This base nature that all of us have. I'm going to tell you, when you combine those three things together, it can take its toll uh, on a person's mind. It can take its toll uh, on a person's thoughts about where they stand with God. So let's go over it very quickly because I've got some other things. And I want to ask you, what category do you fit in tonight? Do you know you're saved? Are you kind of confused about it? Do you know you're lost? Have you been holding on to some religious event, some, something that you can go back to in, in your history, that you say, well, that's when I got saved, but really in your heart, and really when it comes to thinking about dying and your eternity, uh, there's just not a lot of assurance there. Let me give you this little example and kind of tell you, I think, the direction I'm going. I heard about a story about a man that was looking for directions. And he was going through uh, kind of a, a residential neighborhood. Somehow he got off the beaten path and had got in that residential neighborhood. And, and so he saw a little boy standing out uh, in a yard. And he said, well, that boy probably lives here and he can probably direct me to where I'm going. And so 
he, he pulled up to him and he said, son, um, where, how do I get to town? The little boy said, I don't know. He said, well, where does this road, this road right here, where does it go? The little boy said, I don't know. He said, huh. He said, well, how do I get to Interstate 20? Can you tell me how to get to Interstate 20? And the little fellow brother Jimmy said, I don't know. Well, that kind of frustrated the man, you know. He's lost to begin with. No man likes to ask directions. And so he was having to do that. And, and now he was he up on this little Yahoo that didn't know, uh, you know, anything, uh, how to help him in any way. And the man was kind of frustrated. And, and Brother Brian, he looked at him and he said, well, son, you don't know anything, do you? And the boy said, well, I know I ain't lost. <laughs> now I can tell you tonight, Brother Allen, there may be, and there are, a lot of things I don't know. But I know I ain't lost. I know uh, that I'm saved and I know that my soul is secure. And I trust tonight that everyone came in knowing that. And if you didn't, my prayer is, uh, is that before the message is over, that you can leave knowing where you stand with God. Well, uh, of, of all the things that we need to know, wouldn't you agree with me that our uh, eternity is something that we need to be sure about? Let me try to rephrase that. Of everything that you know, and there are people in this room that are highly educated. There are folks who have achieved things academically. You've, uh, you've achieved things uh, in your career. You've learned, continue to learn today. But of all the things you know, what does that matter if you don't know where you stand with God? What does it matter? Kind of like, I don't know how many of you remember... Uh, Years ago, I can remember it. Um, it used to be that at least country doctors would, would make house calls. Any of you remember that? And I remember uh, Dr. Barnes, where I grew up. He was a, a doctor in, a, in our little town of Tuttle, Mississippi. And, and so uh, he would see folks at his office, and then those folks who were not able to come to him, Brother Wayne, he would go and make house calls. And I remember one time my granddad had the flu, and Dr. Barnes, I... I was there with mother. Mother was there trying to help him. And, and Dr. Barnes came, and, you know, carried that little bag in and, and, you know, doctored him at the house. Well, those days are gone. Uh, Brother Mark can't hardly get him to come see you in a hospital room today. They, they hire these fellows that you can't understand to take care of that. And, and then, you know, we're, we, we'd uh, hard to even get a doctor to come see you. And hard for you to get in to see a doctor for that matter, isn't it? Hard to make an appointment. Well, story I heard was, was that it was in those days where the uh, doctor went to make a house call and he came in and he was toting his little medical bag. And Brother Dean, he, she, the wife said, well, he's upstairs. And, and so he climbed the stairs and a few minutes later, he, he came about halfway down. And he said, ma'am, do you have a screwdriver? And, and she said, yeah, I got it. She went and got him a screwdriver. And a few minutes later, he came back and said, ma'am, do you have a pair of a pliers like channel locks or something like that. Do you have any channel lock pliers? And she went and got them and, and handed them to him. And he went back up a few minutes. He came back down. He said, Ma'am, do you have a hammer? And, and she said, What in the world's wrong with him? What, what, what in the world's wrong? He said, I don't know. I can't get my bag open. <laughs> as smart as he was and as much education as he had, it didn't do any good till he got the bag open, right? There was just something... Now, the point that I'm making to you is no matter what else you may know, no matter what else you may have accomplished, uh, if you haven't got this settled, if you don't know what this is, uh, then all the rest of it means nothing. One more example. I'm going to try to move on uh, and point out some things to you. Do you remember in the Old Testament, there was a man by the name of Naaman. you remember him? Uh, he was second in command to King Benadad uh, II. Naaman uh, had climbed the ladder. You talk about a man being at the pinnacle of his career at the top of the ladder. Look, if you were in the military, well, Jimmy, how much higher could you go than be second in command on the king? I mean, Naaman had done it, right? And the Bible tells us about him. It, it tells us about this about it. it. says he was a man that was full of valor. He was a man that was full of honor. 
All these things were said about him. He had amazed people uh, at the strategy that he had put forth uh, in some of the military victories that he had he had achieved. Uh, and it goes and he tells us all of these wonderful accolades uh, that could be said about Naaman. And then it says this, but. You know that little word, B-U-T, but? That's a game changer, isn't it? That means all those other things were one subject, but now you fish and get another story. It's a little conjunction that it's a, it's a game changer when you read it. A little word, but, and what does it say? He was a leper. Now let me ask you, do you think Naaman got up every morning and said, oh, oh, you know, after he got this leper, do you think he got up and said, oh, I'm a wonderful general. Oh, look at all the victories that I've had. Oh, look at how much money. And he was. He was a rich man. He was willing to pay all he had. Go, go read about it. I'm telling you, you're talking about uh, millions of dollars that he was willing to spend uh, for his own uh, uh, health and to get well. And, but you think he got up thinking about that? Let me tell you what he got up knowing that none of the rest of that matters. I'm a leper. And I'm going to die with leprosy. A painful death. Unless I can get things fixed. And so I hope I've impressed that on your mind tonight because it, 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 it is necessary that uh, I, I, I move on. But I, I want you to be sure of where you stand tonight. All day, and my mind's been on the message and trying to prepare to talk to you all tonight. And, and um, I, I don't know. I, I've come with a burden and I, I trust that I'm able to express that to you. Uh, and, and I trust that God's Word will accomplish uh, uh, that uh, for which it's intended. Now, uh, you know, uh, I, I think about uh, some of the things that, that we have uh, ev uh, evidence for. Um, let me refer, that we need evidence to prove. I, I, don't, I don't know of any of you, I, I don't think any of you are at the, it's been so long ago now, a lot of people that were there are going in eternity. And I've been married for nearly 40 years, and uh, 38 years I believe this year, 37 years this year. We married in 85, how long was that, 37? 37 years, I think. And so, I don't think any of you were there. And so, when we walked in, they had anybody ask us. But, uh, Brother Brian, I, I guess y'all all just assume we married, huh? And, and I guess if you ask me, are, are you and Denise married? Are you married? I, I, I could say, yeah, I'm married. And, and, and I could begin to, uh, Brother Mark, I could begin to describe to you, I could tell you where we got married. I could tell you the date that we got married. November of 85. I, I know that date. I can tell you who performed the ceremony, who pronounced this man and wife. I can't tell you all the attendance because she had a dozen on her side and I had to fill it up. And, and I don't remember who, I was going out to the highways and hedges trying to scrape up people to, be in, to tell you the truth. I, you know, I wasn't near popular as she was and so uh, she had all, I couldn't tell you all the attendance were, but I could describe the wedding to you. But if I went before a judge, Brother Everett, and he said, are you married? I said, yes, sir, I'm married. And I began to describe the wedding. And I began to describe, uh, you know, how when Denise walked down that aisle, my old heart Twitter paid it or whatever. And if I began to try to describe all that, that wouldn't cut nothing with him, would it? <clears throat> that wouldn't mean a thing to him. You know what he'd want? He'd want some evidence. And you know what I'd have to go do? I'd have to go to, I guess, Covenant County. I, I don't know. We, we got married in Covenant County. I lived in Forest County. I don't, I'd have to go look, see where it's registered at. But see, either in Covenant County or Forest County, Mississippi, I'd have to go to the courthouse. And I'd have to, because I, do you know where a marriage license is? I don't know where they are. And, and I'd have to dig out some kind of record that we had been married. And Brother Jimmy, when I, when I walked in there with a, with a copy of a marriage license that had been, steal, uh, had been sealed uh, by the proper authority in whatever county that, that it was recorded in, and, and whatever information was on it, the dates and the, whatever they have to do, and, and if I walked into that judge and I said, look, I, didn't have to, I wouldn't have to tell him a thing about the ceremony. Would I wouldn't have to mention how pretty Denise was in her dress and how my heart kind of skipped to be. Huh? I would, I, I, all that wouldn't matter. All that mattered was if I had evidence I was married or not. 
Now you see, I said all that to say this because most of the time uh, when I begin to talk to people about when they got saved, you know what I get? I get all about the experience. I learned who baptized them. I learned that they were saved on a night of a revival when old brother so-and-so was still preaching uh, and you know they came and they joined the, I sometimes even learn uh, what creek they were baptized in or what baptistry that they were baptized in uh, and, and, I, and I hear all of that and, and I hear about how they felt and, and what salvation you know just this wonderful feeling that they got now tonight I want to be well understood I, I don't want to leave anybody in confusion I want to tell you, we need more evidence than that. Oh yeah. I got to say, 40 years ago, this year, 40 years ago, and, and I, I'd be hard-pressed to even think like I thought then, to tell you the truth. I was 18 years old. There's a lot of difference in the way a 58-year-old man thinks than the way an 18-year-old boy thinks. I can tell you that. I don't even know that I could relate to my former self. <laughs> uh, Brother Jimmy, that's been a long time ago. And in those 40 years, I've experienced every kind of feeling that a person could. I mean, you, you talk about human emotions and what things feel like. Let me tell you, in those 40 years, I've run the gamut. I know every human emotion that exists. Uh, and I felt every one of them. And, and there have been days, just to be honest with you, there have been days that I felt wonderful and I felt exhilarated and I felt just wonderful and I felt saved. And then there have been other days uh, that I've gone through life uh, and I'm telling you my... My chin was almost on the ground. My heart was broken inside of me. I have grieved the loss of people uh, that were constants in my life. And I can tell you uh, that as I've gone through some dark places, uh, there have been times, Brother Wayne, uh, I didn't feel so good, just to tell you the truth. Uh, and there have been times, uh, if you want to know the truth, uh, I'm not sure I felt like a person that was a saved person. Uh, I felt like I'd been abandoned by friends. Uh, sometimes I even felt like I have been abandoned by God. Prayers that I had prayed, uh, He didn't answer them the way I wanted them answered. Uh, and I felt like I'd been abandoned by no. Uh, every day since I've been saved uh, hadn't been roses and no thorns. Uh, honey and no bees. It just hadn't been that way. Uh, it's been life. And Job said uh, that it's a few days and full of trouble. Uh, and I just want to be honest with you. When I go to thinking about uh, you know that night that I got saved and, and how I felt... Uh, I don't even know I'm qualified to tell you what it felt like. Uh, so many feelings have come and gone since then. Uh, listen to me. Uh, I'm not basing being saved uh, on the feelings I had uh, as an 18-year-old boy. I've heard Tom come up and say, well, uh, I was, you know, and look, some of you may make friends of faith when you're very young. In no way am I disparaging you. But I've heard men, grown men, say, well, I got saved when I was eight years old and this is what it felt like. How in the world do they remember that? Salvation is not about how we feel. Salvation is about the evidence we have that we have trusted Christ. That's what it's about. Well, in fact, it may surprise you all to know that the Bible... The Bible, Brother Howell, never, never does it use a personal experience to try to lead somebody to Jesus. Have you ever noticed that? Never does. And, and never did a person confirm their salvation to others or witness of their salvation to others, testify of their salvation to others. You know, say, well, what about Paul on the road to Damascus? That might be an exception on the fringes of it, but that's on the fringes, I can tell you. What he was telling about was more than just a conversion experience. Paul had to tell that but because people doubted his apostleship. People doubted that he was called to preach to Gentiles as mean and, and, and you know, 
uh, hateful as he'd been to the Gentile church. Well, with all that being said, uh, the Bible never asks us to, uh, you know, prove our salvation uh, by our feelings. Uh, uh, you know, have you ever heard anybody say, boy, if you can't show me the time, if you can't show me the spot, if you can't show me the moment that you trusted Christ, well, then I'm not going to believe you're saved. And I mean, it sounds good, I guess. I mean, people got away with it for a long time. But they, preachers have preached that a long time, as long as I remember. But it ain't in the Bible. It's just not in the Bible. Now, where'd that come from? I don't know. But it didn't come from the Bible. Point me to one verse, Brother Mark, where it says, to prove your salvation, you got to know the time. You got to know the date. You got to know the spot. And you got to know just how you felt. It's just not there. It, it just don't it, it exist. The Bible never says you know you're saved by something you remember in the past. The Bible says you know you're saved if you believe on God. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you know, I believe in eternal security the believer as strong as anybody here. But I've talked to people before, and I know these other preachers have. They've talked to people before, and, and they'll tell us, well, preacher, I got saved when I was, you know, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, and, and you know, I don't act like it now. No, sir, I don't go to church, and I, I know I live like the devil. I, I know that I do whatever I want to do, and... and uh, let me, let me tell you something. But, they, but I know I'm saved. I, I, I know I'm saved because I remember. I remember when I trusted Christ. I remember what it felt like. And, and you know what I want to do? I, I want to just take them and shake them and say, listen to me. If you're living high, wide, and handsome, and you're doing whatever you want to do, living however you want to live, boy, I'm going to tell you why. And, uh, you got some flimsy evidence that you got saved. Uh, and uh, be careful uh, uh, about risking something as important as my eternity on it. Your eternity. We're not talking about the color carpet here. We're, we're not talking about what color your house is. Uh, we're not talking about something that's not going to matter in a few years, Brother Dean. Uh, we're talking about a never dying soul. That's, what, that, that's why it's so, so important. Now before I leave that, I remember the day I got married. And I remember the day I got saved. I mean, but just as me remembering the day I got saved won't prove it to a judge, i got to have some evidence. Us remembering an event that occurred in our lives, that's not, that's not enough evidence. I'm not saying a person can't know the time, not know the spot. I'm just telling you, what about a person losing their mind? What about that? What about your daddy? You don't go ask Brother Will for not where he got saved. What's, Brother Will, what's he going to tell you? He don't know, does he? You said he don't know you sometimes. Where's that put him? You, you see what I'm trying to get across? He can't tell you how it felt. He can't, can't tell you. Evidence. That, that's what we're looking for. And that's what 1 John chapter 5 uh, talks to us about. Listen, this is what I believe. <clears throat> God knew that we was going to have faulty memories. God knew that we was going to have fickle emotions. God knew that we was going to have fearful doubts. God knew all that before He ever made us. He, he knew every bit of that. And yet, He gave us a way. In fact, He dedicates an entire book here toward the end of the Bible to give us proof that we're saved. To give us proof that we know Him. Do people doubt? Sure. Is doubt good? No. No. It's not good. It, it, do people do it? Yeah. It's, do you ever have a headache? Is it good? 
You ever have a backache? Is that good? Any other pain? What I'm telling you is, is that doubt. Are you listening? Doubt is to our spirit what pain is uh, to our physical body. When we have pain in our body, Brother Allen, uh, we know there's something wrong. We got to go investigate. Got a terrible pain in my side, doctor. I need to know what's going on. I got a terrible pain here. I got this lump that comes up that just hurts. Uh, what's, what's going on? With? Listen, when doubt comes, uh, it, it's not a good thing, Brother Howell. Oh, no. It, it, but, but it comes, it happens, uh, but it only happens when something is wrong with us spiritually. Brother, Brother James Broom used to have a saying. I, I'll use him tonight. I, I know you all remember him and heard him preach a lot. A wonderful preacher. Very gifted man of God. And, and he had a way of just, you know, describing things, getting things across. I loved him very much. He, uh, he, he said that, you know, uh, he, he was uh, talking to a man one time and the man said, well, I've never doubted that I'm saved. An older man, he said, I've never doubted I'm saved. Brother Broom said, well, I doubt you are. He, he, he said he said that now. Granddaddy said he didn't know how Brother Broom got away with saying all he said. He said, said somebody be popped him upside the head. So I don't know how he got away with it, Brother Everybody but he said he did anyway. And the man said, you know, I've never had a doubt. Brother Broom said, well, I doubt you are. And then when he would tell that story, probably you've heard him tell it before, he would go on and say, that's like a man coming and saying that he's you know, lived with his wife for a long time and they've never had an argument. He said, I doubt that fellow's really married. Well, I thought that sounded good. It was very you know, kind of catchy and so I, I was going to use it, you know. I gave him credit for it. Well, well, not I preach that, Brother Wayne. Oh, it's been a long time ago. And I made that statement. I said, you know, a fellow doubting that, you know, not ever doubting that he saved. It's like a man saying that he married and never, you know, went through the whole thing, had an argument with his wife. And when I got through, there's a man come out the door and he said, Brother King. Well, he said, Brother King, we've been married 25 years. We've never had an argument. I didn't say anything. I didn't doubt it. He, he seemed kind of wimpy to me. And probably he was just her doormat. She probably, probably right. He, he probably never disagreed with her. But I'm telling you that if you're here tonight and you doubt your salvation, either you didn't get it or there's something wrong with your spirituality that needs to be checked because there's evidence that we can be saved. Well, I think I've talked enough. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, you know, Denise has been on me all week. Why do you preach so long? I said, because you need it. John chapter 5, let's go back to verse 6. Let's look at a couple things together. There are three things that I want to tell you tonight that I believe are evidences that we're saved. I don't have to base what happened all those years ago on what I felt. No, I, I don't have to do that. But I have evidence. Are you listening? I have evidence. And we all have evidence. And I want to look at three things that will show us uh, whether we're saved or not. This is evidence that we can take to the judge. In fact, uh, we're going to have to stand before the judge with it one day, aren't we, Brother Jimmy? And, and, and what's going to determine whether I'm saved or not uh, is not how I felt. What's going to determine is whether Brent King's written in the, in, in the Lamb's Book of Life. That's what's going to matter. And this is how we can know. Look at what we see here. Let's go back to verse 6. Open your Bibles if you've already closed them because this is very important. In verse 6 he says, This is He that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. Jesus Christ. Let me tell you the first evidence that I have that I'm saved is because of the work of a Savior. If you keep your notes, write that down. You can know you're saved, you're right, because of the work of of a Savior. It ain't about you. It, it, it's not about how you feel or, or what kind of emotional things going on with you. That's not it at all. What matters is is if you have believed in the atoning work of a Savior. Now look, I, I want, and I know probably, look, you preachers, look, I'm not going <clears> to, <throat> and I don't think you will. I, I didn't come here to argue and 
with anybody about the Scripture. And let me say this about verse 6. As long as I've been alive, people have argued about what water and blood means. Until Jesus comes back, there's going to be Bible students that will argue about what the water is and what the blood is. But to me, folks, it's no argument. And the reason there's no argument to it is because the very fellow that's writing this to us has already wrote to us about it. He's told us what he's talking about if we would just listen to him. In John chapter 19, you don't have to turn, I have it noted. Write it down if you want to. John chapter 19 verse 33 says this, But when they came to Jesus, you remember on the cross, they were trying to expedite His death and they were going to break the... Well, they did. They broke the legs of the malefactors that were hanging beside Him and so they were about to break His legs to speed it up. Holy, uh, you know, high Sabbath was coming and so they wanted Him off the cross. Well, they had to get off the cross. But when they got to Jesus, He was dead after all, only six hours. And so it was unnecessary for them to break his legs. John goes on and says, so that the prophecy could be filled. But in verse 34, he says this, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and what? Water. He didn't come by blood only, Brother Jimmy. He came by water too. Isn't that what, the, isn't that what he's saying here? There's your blood and water. Just as simple as it can be, Brother Mark. It, that, that's, that's what the blood and water is. And he that saw it, I looked at it and bear record. Let me tell you folks something. When all this gospel business started out, it started out as an obscure promise that was made to Abraham. And when I say obscure, it was kind of obscure. Hey, you know, by the your seed, all families, all nations of the earth going to be blessed. Come on, and look on the stars. And, and you can't count the stars. The sands of the sea. You just said, Every family, every nation of the earth is going to be blessed. Well, who was that? That was a promise that Jesus was going to come through the lineage of Abraham, right? Then years went by, and we began to get it not just as a promise, as a promise, brother Jimmy, but we began to get it as a report. Isaiah. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And then he begins to describe how Jesus is. Tender plant, root out of dry ground. The iniquity of us all was laid on his shoulders. By his stripes we are healed. So on and so forth. Man, verse after first, uh, verse describing the Lord and that's the report. Well, that's a little better than a promise, isn't it? We got this promise that is obscuring the fact that he don't give us all the details. Then we've got this report that begins to tell us more. But Brother Jimmy, you didn't have to believe a promise to get saved. You didn't have to believe a report to get saved. You believed a record. I'm going to tell you, that excites me. You all don't act like that matters much to you. I don't put a smile on your face. Uh, that God made it easier for us than any other group of people that's ever lived. Uh, well, Jimmy, we didn't have to believe uh, some promise and try to figure out the promise made to Abraham. We didn't have to try to figure out the reports uh, uh, that were in the prophets preaching. Uh, we got a record. We've got a record that tells us just exactly where he was born, uh, who he was born to, uh, the tribe that he came from, uh, and the uh, uh, circumstances of his birth. A record that tells us of the perfect life that he lived. Uh, a record that tells us of the horrible, horrendous death uh, that he died. Uh, a record that tells us, that, listen, he ascended back to heaven and there he offered his blood uh, as atonement for our sins. Uh, I want to tell you something, folks. Uh, if that don't get you excited, uh, something's not right. Isn't it wonderful tonight that we don't have to base uh, our salvation upon what we feel we can base it on the fact of a record of our Savior. Water and blood. Everybody in here all said amen then. I'm going to get me a sign. Amen. Based on a record. Let's talk about that water and blood for just a moment. Would you say that <clears throat> Well, the temple worship. I was trying to think which, what, what I really want to say here. Would you say that the temple worship is... Uh, well, how would you say that that's a picture of Jesus to come? Well, sure it is. It is. You remember what happened in the temple, huh? 
So the priest would go in, and the first thing you went, you come on, Brother Allen, was that bloody altar, right? Bloody altar. And then where'd the priest go? He, he went to a basin, we would call it. Uh, what does the scripture call it? A, 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 a leaven of water. And, and so he, he goes to that basin, and what does he do then? In what? Not blood, but water. There's Jesus, Mark. There's our Savior in picture and in type. The bloody sacrifice. Listen to me. It's through that blood. It's through that blood that our, that our, our sins uh, are forgiven. That's what the Scripture says. That, that through His blood that our sins are forgiven. The Bible tells us uh, that He came by blood and water. And what you see when you see that uh, is that that blood is the saving blood. That water it's the sanctifying water. And so we overcome, Brother Allen, not just through salvation that cleanses us, uh, but we overcome the world through the blood that paid our sin debt and the water that cleanses our life. Salvation and sanctification. Listen, listen to me, friend. If you don't have both, you don't have either. Right? Right? If you don't have both, you don't have either one of them. If you haven't been saved by the blood, then the Bible, the water of the Word, does not wash you and sanctify you. You see, the salvation thing is three things. It always has been. It deals with our yesterday by forgiving us of sin. It deals with us today, with our today, by helping us deal with sin as we go through this life. But one day when I enter into heaven, it's going to deal with sin in the greatest way of all, and I'm going to be removed from the presence of sin. I've already been removed from the penalty. As I go through life, the washing water will remove me from the power. And one day, I'm going to be removed from the presence. You know what that is? And the way we preach that is justification, sanctification, and what? All right, say it loud. Glorification. All three. Salvation deals with the past, the present, and the future. It's a wonderful thing to have it. But I don't know I have it simply because of the way I felt when I was 18. I know I have it, Brother Wayne, because I've been washed some. I got pretty dirty. Hadn't you ever, have you ever got dirty? Pretty nasty. And, and I tell you, you carry that old... How many of you men ever work, worked hard? I, I know, Brother Dean, you probably can't relate to this. You probably never worked hard and got sweaty or nothing, have you? And so, but some of us have, and we work hard and we come in and we're all sweaty and worked hard. And well, I'm going to tell you, I don't sit down and I can get in a shower and I can get a bath. And, and I don't know when that bath, I just feel so much better. Isn't it amazing what a shower can do for you? How much better it can make you feel? I'm going to tell you, there have been days that I was, you know, blackened by sin. Days where I failed the Master. And I needed to be renewed. And I needed to be revived. And I needed to be cleansed. And I'm so thankful that, you know, we have the Word to do that. The way I know I'm saved, it's number one because I know Jesus. And I know the sacrifice that He made for me. The price He paid for me on Calvary. It's a historical fact He died on the cross. You don't have to be spiritual to believe it. You're a fool if you don't believe it. It's a historical fact that He died on the cross. And that's the saving work of Christ. Let's move on or I will get through. I believe it because of the work of the Savior. I know I'm saved because of the work of the Savior. And here's... The next thing I want you to see, <clears throat> not only does verse 6 tell us about the work of the Savior, but verse 7 tells us about the witness of the Spirit. Now what's a witness? Why do we need witnesses? You go in a courtroom and they swear you in to get on the 
witness stand. I don't know how many of you have ever been on a witness stand. I have been. And, and so what they made me do is they made me put my hand on the Bible and well, my hand and raise my right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth? Nothing but the truth. So help you God. I do. Why they put that so help you God in there? Why does every president that's ever been sworn in, Brother Mark, say, carry out his duties, protect the constitution from enemies foreign and domestic, and then at the end of it, what does he say? So help me God. Because the job's bigger than any man. You know, on the witness stand, you know, a person memory could a person could tell her, you know, not tell the truth. Well, you could outright lie, but there you could be mistaken. And so you say, you know you need God, so help me God. And then you become a witness. But here's the thing, folks. A witness is there for one reason. And that is to give evidence so that evidence of fact so that proof can be ascertained. So that proof can be found. That's the only reason for a witness. Now, if a lawyer gets a witness, that proof. Truthful as he or she can be. They can't tear down their story in any way. They cross-examine them and they can't find one flaw. What did they do next? They try to destroy their character. They try to catch them in a lie. They try to make them a witness. They try to ruin their reputation. Because once you ruin the reputation of a witness, you can't believe nothing they said. It's over if you can destroy their reputation. But we have a witness that is the most reliable witness that has ever existed. And that's a God that can't lie. Think about the Holy Spirit and His role as a witness. The Bible said that it's greater than men. That the witness of the Spirit is greater than man. If we receive the witness of man, it says if we receive what it ought to say and what it, what it does say. That word if is really since. We, because we all receive the witness of men, right? We receive the witness of men every day. I'm sure you do. I, I had left some medicine at home. We had to call and get a prescription for you. And so... Uh, my doctor at home called in a prescription to a, a CVS here in Mobile. Well, I don't know them folks at CVS in Mobile. I know the people I deal with at home. We deal with a little local drugstore at home, Brother Mark. I know them all pretty well. My care, my middle daughter worked there. I know all of them that's in there. I know the man that owns it. I, I know the pharmacies that work in there. And I trust them. I, I, you know, I, I know, but over here, I, don't, I mean, that could have been a... That pharmacist could have been a terrorist trying to kill preachers for poison medicine. I don't know. But I didn't think nothing about it. I took the medicine. You know what? Well, I received the witness of a man that I didn't even know, or a woman that I didn't even know, right? How many of you ever fly? Miss Faye was talking about flying, how much, you know, she didn't want to fly, and then that she's still not too crazy about it. Miss Faye, when you got on that plane going out west, did you go up there and ask that pilot to show you his license? <coughs> Just got on a hell of a dear life, didn't you? <laughs> I've flown a lot. I've never asked the pilot to show me his license. Did you? Hey, buddy. Show me your license. He'd say, no. yeah, I'll put it. No, show me your license. And I can go on. You understand my point? We'll get on elevators. Do you all know how elevators work? I don't. I mean, I think it's pulleys and chains and more pulleys or something. I don't know. And all that. I just turned up on that elevator. Like I built it. And trust me, I received a witness of me. You know that? But the witness of God is greater. The Holy Spirit that bears witness with our spirit, right? That we are the children of God. Think about, uh, think about it for 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 just a moment. 
It's a reliable witness. And Brother Albert, it's greater than the words of men. Let me use this example. So last night I ate with Brother Albert there. We did. Wonderful meal. She two cakes, right? Yeah. A German chocolate cake and a carrot. Well, carrot. I love the carrot cake. My favorite kind of cake. But I, I don't know. I've been trying to diet. And all these meetings, you know, I've always been on a diet most of my life. I've lost enough weight to fill up a tractor trailer reading. I just somehow find it before it's over. So, I don't know. You know, I just want to eat. I mean, I really want it. So I, I think you could tell I did. So last night he brought me a to-go plate with a big old chunk of uh, carrot cake in it, piece of carrot cake in it, and German chocolate too. Well, I got in. I sat there on the counter at the motel a little while I walked by and I said, you know, well it kind of caught me. You know, Please, come get me. And so I reached somewhere. I couldn't find a fork in that present hotel room, and but I made do. <laughs> I ate a pretty good portion of it. And uh, here's the thing: if somebody would have come by and said, "About the time I finish that up," right? there's no such thing as carrot cake. I did that last. And I just had to say, look, I got a witness in me. Right? I'm going to tell you, if somebody comes by, Brother Jimmy, they say ain't nothing to this religious thing. They say nothing to this salvation thing. I just kind of have to smile and say, I got the witness in me. You're not going to talk me out of it. You'll never convince me carrot cake's not real. I'm full of it. You'll never convince me that the Holy Spirit is not real and that salvation is not real because the Spirit bears witness with our spirit. It bears witness. Not, not only uh, is it a reliable witness, not only is it a revealer of the truth. Without the Holy Spirit, we could have never known we're lost. Without the Holy Spirit, who would have believed that story about Jesus? Somebody born of a virgin that came... Look, it's a strange story, isn't it? He, he created the world, and yet uh, he, he, he came as a baby in a... I mean, it's weird, isn't it? It's a weird story when you stop and think about it. It's just as odd as it can be. How many of us would believe that as intelligent adults? How many of us would believe? How many of you still believe it? Well, they're not saying that. You know, we tell our children about that. I just barely leave that alone. There are some characters that we make up, and for a while a child believes them, don't they? But they grow out of it. And, and Brother Jimmy, if this story of Jesus was no more than that, let me tell you, we might believe it for a while, but we'd grow out of it. But the Spirit, God showed it to us. A God that can't lie. So it's the revealer of truth. It's the revealer that we're sinners. It's the revealer of who God is. It's the revealer that we're going to hell. And, and it's also the revealer of, of righteousness. So... The evidence of my salvation is based on the work of a Savior. And it's based on the witness of a Spirit. I'm going to close now. But there's one more thing. Not only is it based on the work of a Savior, not only is it based on the witness of the Spirit, but it's also based upon the Word of God. The Word of God. The Bible's my birth certificate. Brother Allen. That's what it is. You know, I can go to a place like Romans 10, 13, for whosoever is called in the name of the Lord shall be saved. I did that, didn't you? I can go to places like John 5 said, He that believeth on Him that sent me, verily, verily, I saith unto him, He that heareth my word and believeth on Him that sent me, what? Hath. Already happened. Hath passed from death unto life and shall not come into condemnation. Brother Jimmy, that's part of my birth certificate. The Bible, God's Word, assures me that I'm saved. Listen, the first joy 
of being saved is knowing you are. And there's nothing that will block joy any quicker than to doubt you are. Nothing that will take away joy. And I can tell you this evening on the authority of a Word of God. Listen, on the Word of an immutable God. A God that can't change. I want to tell you something. The stars would fall from the sky before I lose salvation. The mountains would be sucked under. The oceans would be drained. All of this that God controls. Boy, if I lose salvation, He'll lose everything. But He can't. He can't. That's the point. He's unchangeable. He's immutable. And He said, Whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. All right, I gotta let you all go. But let me tell you what I read about years ago. <clears throat> Golden Great Golden Gate Bridge being constructed. And men were falling off that thing left and right. They, they were dying, Brother Jimmy, and, and you know it was a it was a hazard. And so they decided for safety's sake that they'd build a net underneath that Golden Gate Bridge. And after they did, only ten more ever fell off of it. But all ten were saved by the net. But this is what they found. Do you know that re uh, work increased by the mark significantly? Like 25%. Their work speed, it increased. You know why? They felt secure. They felt safe. There is nobody that's ever going to be fit to serve God or to witness for God until first of all they're secure. And they're healed. And their doubts are, are no longer there. And if you... Listen. If you... Uh, one more time. D.L. Moody had a man come to him one time. He said, I don't know that. The same came to him and told him that, you know, at one time he thought he was saved and now he didn't know. And so... Moody took John 5. That passage I just quoted up. There he is. He said, What about that? Yes, and he said, What about that? He said, Well, I'm still not sure. I still don't know. He said, Well, do you believe? He said, Yes, I've done that. He read it again. He thought, Well, I don't know. He said, Well, have you believed? Have you trusted that? I said, I'm still saying. Moody read it one more time and asked him the same question. And then when the man asked him basically the same way, he said, Sir, who are you doubting? Who, who are you doubting? Now, if you were seeing yourself as a sinner, and if you will trust the redemptive work of Christ to be your atonement for sin, if you with all your heart desire to be different than you are tonight, if you're tired of doing that, and you won't rest, and you won't assure, the Bible says if you will do just that, you'll come to him believe that you have passed from death and life. I don't know what you'll feel like, because the scripture don't say it. It doesn't say it. It just says it happens, doesn't mean that's what the Bible says. That if we do that, then we're saved. I don't know how to make you more simple than that. So, forget about all these feelings that you've heard and all these feelings that you're looking for. And just come to Jesus. And trust Him. And know that you're passing death and life. And if I take the message and cleanse it from my mistakes, I pray it can be used to be a blessing to those of who listen. If there's someone here who's never trusted you, I pray they can see the simplicity of being saved. And then if there's someone here through who through circumstances of life and uh, other issues of life have have come to doubt uh, who you are to them. I pray, Lord, that they would see tonight that uh, you're everything you ever promised that you would be and that you're still their Savior. We ask this for Jesus' sake. In His name we pray. Amen.